Don't worry about that. I think it's just what we learned from the case. Okay. We know for almost two years now, we've been dealing with modified software. Uh, originally, I'm going to go over this too. Originally, we were doing uh, what they call data check fails. Vehicles were failing for data check for a number of reasons. Then in July of 22, I think it was, Bar decided that they were going to go split it out into modified software. Now, I always say this about the modified software. You may not see a lot of them, but the point being is if you do, you need to understand it, the purpose of doing this and why it's happening. But understand, unless you took your HP tuner or some other system like that and re-modified re the, modified the vehicle yourself, you're not responsible for it. But you have to explain it to the consumer who may or may not know about the vehicle. They probably do, but if they don't, they may have bought a vehicle, then what their course of action would be. So if we're gonna we're gonna focus on the global side and, and, and it can be found on the OE side too, don't get me wrong. But we're gonna go into what I call mode nine in global OBD2. We know the Cal ID is gonna be there. That's gonna be the software version, the part number for that particular system. The key, and we've talked about this in the little past, and I still have a video on my website on uh, on my YouTube channel on CVNs, and I'm blown away that that's the one that keeps going up every day. So somebody must, people must be interested in learning more about this or they're seeing something, because in the last couple of months, it's gone up over 400 on that. And I know it's probably mostly California guys, but calibration verification number. There's a couple of you that may go back to the bar 84. Uh, I don't know, does anybody in this group go back to bar 84? Or am I the only one? Okay, I'm the only one. We used to have the machine fail and would say checksum error. Well, this is the checksum to make sure somebody has not modified the software. Uh, I told my students and some of you years ago that this would be the next level of defense when it comes to failing vehicles. Well, with the state's beta database getting bigger and bigger and bigger with so many of the same vehicles, they're able to pull this stuff together. And basically it's to verify the integrity of the software that nobody has tampered with it because tampering with that software is an emissions tamper, tamper uh, subject to a $2,500 fine is under federal laws. And basically uh, when you modify it, you're changing the bits in there and that changes the CVN. Uh, the hard part about this is, and makes this difficult is, most manufacturers don't publish this. And I'm not asking you to be an expert on this. I'm just making sure that you understand it and if you're not in the global side, you can, again, you can, you should be able to find it in the OE side, but the global side is the quickest, easiest way to find it. Um, so what is BAR using when they're looking at this? Um, all this information. Um, first of all, when they're checking these vehicles, and I just got off the phone call from a guy who runs a training program down south, and he's he's not far from that shop, the training center that was using that that got basically arrested for on the federal level for using that uh, pro, uh, programmer. Um, and he, he said the same thing, you know, it's like he only has to deal with a couple of schools down there and a couple of places are training and stuff, but there's still fraud going on. So the idea is when they're dealing with what we call modified and directed vehicles, one, they're looking at the dad and they're looking at what voltage is coming out of pin 16, because some of the simulators don't do sick, don't do the actual voltage. They're also looking at PID counts. And I'll show you examples that go away. But Bar finally told us what they were collecting in actual smog inspection information. So every time you hook up to the DAD, what are they collecting? And I'm sure, I don't know if all this is going through uh, Bar 97, uh, but I suspect it is. So if we go to, and I use, notice the word I use. I didn't use the word modes. I'm getting you ready for the next lesson that we'll do tomorrow morning. Service is really the term they're going to be using, but we know them as modes. So mode one are all your data PIDs, okay, and your readiness of flags. And remember, we call them readiness flags, not monitors, because monitor tests make up flags. They collect all that. They look at the same vehicle and know that the same vehicle, same engine, same engine calibration should have the same amount of PIDs reporting. If they don't, that's another. That's one of the red flags. Service mode two, we used to call what we call freeze frame. That is not collected. They don't. They don't collect anything to do with their freeze frame. Uh, service mode three, which was our current and history DTCs, those are all collected. Service mode four, there's nothing to collect there. That's do you want to clear the system or not? Service mode five, 
um, the um, is the O2 sensor um, results. That went away with CAN. There's no point in collecting that. It's basically invalid data in most cases. And in some cases, it's good data. You know, uh, so you want to be aware of that. Uh, mode six, mids and tids, that's all collected. Again, all this is being collected as, you know, the when STAR came out with saying make, model, year, transmission, engine, da 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 Well, this is how they're comparing those vehicles. Pending codes are collected. Even though they're not being used to fail a vehicle, they are being collected by the state. Um, now, one word of caution on this. If you ever have a situation where a vehicle's come in, and I don't know if any of you had this, where when you smogged it, not long after it went out the door, the check engine light came on. Customer's back. Hey, my car didn't have a check engine light on before you smogged it. Hey, you didn't do anything wrong. You just, the, the bar, the machine smogged it, passed it. If you ever got a complaint on that, I would say to bar, hey, could you do me a favor on this vehicle? Could you check your database to see if there were any pending codes in there when the car was inspected? That would explain why it might have come on on a second trip when the vehicle left. Not saying it's going to happen, but something you could find in this information could be beneficial to you. Mode eight, not going to happen. That's your, uh, and it's not bi-directional. That's your control of the EVAP vent solenoid. Nothing there. Mode nine, that is the gold mine for BAR. That's our CBN, that's our Cal ID, and that's our in use monitor performance tracking ratios that we are using and BAR is using, CARB's using to determine what monitor tests are running with what frequency. And this is for both gasoline and diesel. If you remember in the last, uh, probably within the last year and a half, they changed the monitors for. Um, for, gas, for diesel, and one of the reasons they did it is they used the in-use performance, uh, in-use monitor performance race tracking ratios to determine that these vehicles were running their monitor test in these areas often enough that we should be holding the cars accountable to it. And that's created a couple of problems. Example, Ford on some of the uh, uh, diesels where they had a reflash, the vehicles were passing for years and years and years. And then this reflash was put in the vehicles as an update and in reality, it actually made the knock sensors harder to run. And in their follow-up tests, they weren't running. So now Ford's released another reflash for that to hopefully improve that. And then the last one they collect, obviously, is all the permanent DTCs. So when you're hooking up to the machine now, you should be able to start visualizing what's going through there to the dad that that vehicle is transporting. And that's that ring of people I was telling you that got arrested. They were collecting all this information putting it in their system. So they made sure that all this vehicle got passed on from a similar vehicle uh, than what they had. And I guess they had a way to ride in the VIN uh, to uh, make it look like the same vehicle. So pretty sophisticated. Okay. Um, when they go to court cases, and I've seen a couple of them, uh, some of the things they use, obviously they compare VINs, they compare protocols, PID counts by the ECM, and I should say slash TCM, because there are cases where the TCM also reports some emission uh, PIDs. Uh, readiness flag slash monitors. I always say that because I want everybody, and I think all you went through the last, almost all of you went through the class with me. And Chad, did you take my, did you take one of my workshops on this this topic? I might have at a CAD conference, but I didn't. In yeah, the other... in the last last year and a half, you probably have. Yeah, 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 I did. You probably did. I'm trying to get everybody off the word monitors. The monitor is what you're calling. You're calling me, telling me you can't get the monitors to run. It's the flag you get can't get the flip, and it's what monitor test didn't run to make the flag flip. Not that bars are looking at it that way, but they're collecting that obviously. Mainly, what are they looking at? Is it supported? Not supported? Did someone flip the bit? Other factors to be introduced. Again, it's like the star program. Compare like vehicles. Compare similar results from the same vehicle. Uh, and if there's the key, the key to this whole thing is. If they detect any fraud, they're going to head them off to the referee. Simple as that. Let the referee decide. Uh, they did release this information about what they're seeing in tampered vehicles. You, it was early on, still waiting for an update, but this is what they released. You can see it was as expected. Diesels were quite heavy in percentage. Uh, the older vehicles, 1.5, that's not a lot, but it's enough that, hey, if 1% of your vehicles are a headache with a customer, that customer takes up a lot more than 1% of your time. 
Here's some examples of vehicles you might run into out there. Um, when the chances of running into tampered software in those years, and I would be willing to bet some of these go beyond those years. Um, has anybody run in? Does anybody do a lot of work on Subarus? Nobody does. Okay. Nobody's doing cam timing or uh, any chain replacements on those. Okay. Well, a lot of the, a lot of the Subarus are modified and the dealer handles it two ways. I have a, one dealer that, Hey, they were, if they're tampered, they'll reprogram. Them. I have other dealership that says, Hey, if you tampered it, you buy it. I had a quote recently from a shop that he, he was, I point him in the right direction. He says, well, I had to quote this guy on the Subaru $2,200 to put his vehicle back into running order because what he had removed and what had to be reprogrammed and the parts that he didn't keep when he redid it, when he modified it. So it gets into some big bucks. But you can get an idea here of what the chances are of running into a, a tampered vehicle. If you look down this list, I'm sure some of you wouldn't be surprised at what you're seeing. I was a little surprised at the smart car. I was wondering if they were just trying to get more horsepower out of or what they were trying to do. Uh, the Mustangs didn't surprise me. I'm going to show you one later on on a modified software uh, on a CVN. It's not real clear, but uh, from a shop who actually reprograms in New York and uh, showed me the CVN before and after and how it was modified. Uh, but then look at the vehicles that aren't tampered. Almost nothing. Okay, so this is to give you an idea of what they have to deal with. Your chance, or anybody out there who's dealt with modified software? Lots of them on diesels. Yeah, absolutely. Um, squeeze everything you can out of those things. And uh, that's and you saw in their percentages, even those early years, uh, 3.7. And I'm sure if you add that in even later years, it's still going on. Um, you hear them. You go down the road, you know. Now, here's some of the things that I've thought in the past. that We used to say that the CBN and the Cal ID were unique. So one part number for a million cars would have the same CVN. Well, then they run into some problems. Mainly this has been with Fords. Um, this is where some of the issues are. You can see right here, we have the same Cal ID on the left here. Same, oops, same vehicle on the left. Uh, everything is good. Um, same computer. But notice in this case, this one had this many CVNs, different ones. 191 for this one. 59 for this one, 26 for this one, and one. So somewhere Ford, however they did their algorithm on these vehicles, was not consistent. This is not the norm. I would say to you still in probably 98% of the cases, the Cal ID and the CVN bark and bank on and know that this, this one will be the same throughout the whole group. But it does happen. Uh, now we have the opposite case. Again, this was Ford. We have all these different controllers using the same CVN. OK, again, that's not your responsibility, but these are the anomalies that they have to deal with where some vehicles may be pushed through and others may not. But when you hear, again, that CVN and Cal ID should be the same for that same part number, should have that same CVN regardless. There's a there's a couple percentage out there that make it not true. OK, the other thing we have is we do have and if you're looking up EO numbers, and you're looking at uh, uh, modifications. There are software packages that have been certified by CARB. Uh, so again, this is what BAR has to do. All you're doing is inspecting this vehicle as received. Everybody agree? You're not modifying it. If you haven't modified it, you're just respecting it as received. But in the end, when that vehicle fails, it's not BAR. It's not the referee that's initially got to do with the consumer. It's you. So you need to be educated enough on this to at least explain to them what may have happened. Now, I apologize for this, but this is what he sent me from New York. I'll blow it up a little bit. It's not the, I'll tell you what it's, if you can't see it, just notice that this is the, the OEM Ford and there's an F, there's an FP right here on these Fords right here. I think it's an FP or an FF. This is the original software. You come down here and you look at the modified software. There's an E5, there's an A5. Well, this is the kind of stuff that Barr would be looking at if they have enough vehicles in their database that have this, not the VIN, because obviously that would be unique, but the Cal ID and the CVN, in most cases, 99% of the cases, these should be consistent throughout the fleet that use this part number, the CVN. When someone modifies it, then they catch in the database and they have to verify in the database. Who knows? Maybe this was an approved one. But 
they've got to flag this out and they call it data mining to find out why uh, this number is different. Okay, so this is what they have to deal with when it comes to software. Okay, uh, if you did, if you run in this situation and customers really hot about it and they don't know anything about it, they can go ahead and they can make an appointment with a referee. The referee will be the end user or end person to decide on this as to whether this is valid or not valid. Um, they can file a complaint with Barn and get it out of your hands. So you should be aware of the process if you run into one of these. Uh, Ken, what did you have to do on those diesels? Uh, I believe we had to send them to the referee. But I mean, you, like you say, you know, we, when they come in, I, I yeah. you know, I give them a heads up. But dude, it, it's not going to pass. You know, you need to go find your everything you took off, put it back on it, you know. Yeah. And yeah. And a lot of times you can't, you know, if you go and try and beforehand, a lot of them have a lockout and they don't even have the tool that they they tuned it with or deleted it with. And I can't get in and reflash, you know, like a Ford Chevy yeah. Dodge. I have all OEM scan tools to reflash. And a lot of times I can't get in and put them back once they put the parts on there because it's locked. Yeah. So yeah. it's so a headache. Have you, have you had any customers come in that way and they, did, they were totally oblivious to it? They didn't know? Not really. I mean, they knew. Up, yeah. Yeah. Up here, they know. I mean, we're rural a lot. I mean, I mean, more and more diesel than gas. You know. Oh, yeah. Well, that's why if you go back and look at this list, I mean, come on, you've seen these on the streets. You got AMGs out there, you know, have probably been messed around. Uh, you look at the vehicles. Um, not surprising, except down here. Like I said, the uh, smart car uh, was a little surprising. But a GTR, a Shelby, that this one right here was off of a Shelby that they cranked the horsepower up to this thing on a dyno. I had the video somewhere. They cranked this thing up to, I forgot how many horsepower after making their modifications. Um, so it's real out there. This was from the state of New York. Uh, again, if it went in for inspection, it would fail, but I'm sure there's some way they have around it. So just as just a reminder, what I'm saying to you is you got you to gotta face up the customer. You got to deal with them one-on-one. -on -one. Be educated about enough to say, hey, um, this is what may have happened. Or you can probably, like Ken said, you can look right at them and you can see the vehicle and know that uh, it's they are aware of it. But don't take the brunt of it, but you are the first line of defense against that failure when they try and play dumb. So just be educated on it. Okay, uh, pulling this all together, moving along quicker on this one, I thought. Um, then I'll give you guys a couple options when we get done with this one. Case study we had, and this is this is tying in the last class. And guys, you took the last class with me where we did this chart and this information. But we're going to do it again, and there's a couple reasons why. When we get into OBD on UDS, either later after this or tomorrow morning, um, this is going to play a big role in it. Um, not only currently, the way I explain it is, if you remember in-use monitor performance tracking, uh, you we treated the whole O2 as a group. Now we're going to treat each DTC as an individual line item. And understanding this is going to be important because when you have monitored tests that won't run, this is definitely, and I have flags that won't flip, this is where you want to look. And I really believe in this. I'm going to hit the first part of a couple of charts. You know that the results of the smog checker, did it pass, pass all its monitored tests or didn't it? Now you got one that's incomplete, and that's usually the annoying one, one or two. Fords, it's usually the O2 and the O2 heater. Um, other cars, a lot of other cars, it's maybe the one. I've got a Ford right now that the guys, it's beating them up. You can't get the cat to go on a Ford. And that's, that's usually that's unusual. Um, but this ratio, as we've talked about in the past, we're going to review it under UDS, is to give you a clue of the vehicle's history as it comes in the door. And this is only going to get bigger in the amount of, grow in the amount of information it, it's going to give you in the future. Remember I told you the new system is going to be designed around helping techs fix smog failures. And if you have more information available, you might be quicker to make decisions. So in-use performance monitor, in-use monitor performance tracking is part of that system. And we show you tomorrow or later how it's restructured. You'll see why it's going to be important to be in, have an understanding of this. But if I can go in there when the car comes in and it's failing that one or two monitors, uh, readiness flags, I keep saying it, and I can see a history of it coming in the door, I've got a direction to go, okay? And 
we've we've talked before the process of checking for codes, checking for mode six, checking for pending codes. That doesn't change. Checking that if the mode six test results did change, then maybe this thing is in an averaging mode because uh, Fords are good for that, especially. Um, GM's good for that, where they'll go into what they call averaging modes. It's 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 like taking an ASC test. It's once pass or fail. No matter what your day was like, you pass or fail. Averaging modes basically say, we're going to take so many drive cycles, call them drive cycles, monitor trips. We're going to average them out over multiple key cycles, and we're going to make a determination. Well, you might be in the middle of that cycle, and until that cycle is completed, you may not be able to finish flipping that flag. So it's important to realize that. And then you may be in a case where there's no information. You need to recheck. And in some cases, it might take multiple trips. Get some of the old Kias and stuff and Hyundais. Those are nightmares because some of them required multiple trips to get them to go. So this chart I strongly believe in, and I believe it's a good starting point. And again, I don't remember if I use this for you or not, but I'm going to pull everything together we've done today with this. This was a uh, 2000. Uh, 18 Camaro, supercharged, manual transmission. I get the call. He's 40 miles away from my house that he can't get the O2 to complete. So first thing I look at, this vehicle has 13,575 miles on it. It's, uh, it's out of state. Um, he can't get the O2 to run. There is one thing I'd be concerned about. Anything you'd be concerned about on the screen right now? Damn. What? Temperature. Temperature could be one, absolutely. And that's something that's missed. Um, as people don't realize, it's got to get up to a certain temperature, but also fuel level. Remember, we start dropping low in fuel below 15%. They can't suspend the test. So here he is trying to get this one test to run. He's driving it and driving it and driving it. So let's follow my chart. So he's got he's got one incomplete. And that's the O2 sensor. Cat's done. Uh, O2 is done. Does everybody remember? Does that make sense if the cat can be done before the O2? Does anyone remember? That's why I keep reviewing stuff. Well, I remember that one Honda kicked your ass two years ago because you oh. on the cat and you couldn't get the O2 to run. And it was that was kind of a funny story. So I've run into that yeah. in the last couple of years. And from your class, I just go, well, Cats run. O2 is going to run. Exactly. Can't help there you. There are exceptions Drive. to that. Hey, if you remember just that, we're doing good, Scott. Because <laughs> a lot of guys still call me, and they're and I and I, I do these conferences, and I'm blown away when people ask me a question. Well, how could the cat run before the O2? I was always tell you. Remember, it's what we call a parallel monitor. You go down a list of O2 tests, and these tests pass. That part of the O2 will pass. Then all of a sudden, the cat criteria comes up, and these were responsible for getting the cat ready. Now the cat's ready, but we haven't finished the O2 test. Now we go over and run the cat, and then when that's done, we come back and finish these last couple O2 tests that aren't really relevant to the cat running. So that's what we call a parallel monitor. And Scott's right. Probably in 99% of the cases I've seen, if you get the cat done first, the O2 is going to follow. So let's go to our next step. Let's use this logical process that everybody should be using. And if you're not into global tools, I, you can go ahead. And I've got some sitting around here. I'm doing some evaluation of some tools for a company that you don't have to spend a lot of money. But if your tool does not show you in use for monitor performance tracking, you need to have some kind of code reader or something uh, to uh, look at that. Because most of those will give you uh, a good example, Nova does a great job of giving you the, the information you need for uh, emissions testing. And some of the other little code readers, Motor Power, and some of those others give you Mode 9, and you can go in and look at the ratios. So if I go into this vehicle, and I do this, and I think about this vehicle, and I see that I have only 65 ignition cycles for 13,575 miles, am I concerned? Huh. 65 ignition cycles for 13,575 miles. Is that a red flag at all? Does anything enter your minds? Like a weekend car? But 65 key cycles getting you 13,000 miles, would you say that's a good ratio or low ratio or so that's lots of long trips? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, let's take a look at this. 
Didn't it say the cat was complete? What do we got right here? Okay, that's why I'm bringing this case study up again. Even if some of you might have seen it before, I don't think you have, but look at this. It's in, only encountered eight carb trips. And this is why we're going to review this tomorrow because I'm, it's going to play a big role in these new vehicles. If you're going to be around in the next five, six years doing this stuff, this in use performance monitor tracking is going to play a huge role. But I've got a vehicle that has 13,000 miles on it, and it's only in, encountered eight times that the car has been driven for 10 minutes with a 30 second idle and five minutes over 25 miles an hour. That's it. And none does of that mean that that catalyst monitor completion, it, it ran before it ran before the, uh, I don't know what the proper wording is. It ran, but it ran before it finished before all the, I wouldn't say requirements, but the conditions that it needed, it, it set before that. Well, I, I'm going to tell you this, Ken. I've seen this, and, I, and I've seen this where I've had guys run the cat and this stay at zero. But the flag hadn't flipped because it was in an averaging mode, so it needed more of them for this to increase. But I want you guys to think about the mileage on this vehicle and these low numbers. Only, only uh, eight trips with a 30-second idle, continuous idle, 10 minutes of driving, and only five minutes over 25 miles an hour and only 65 key cycles. Does this a red flag for anybody? <laughs> Anything that might draw attention now. Take a look at the next page. Look at the O2s. Okay, so what I'm trying to bring out to you guys on this one, when we get into this tomorrow, when we we'll get into UDS again, and I'm going to refresh all your memory on this, this is a red flag. Something has happened with this vehicle. Now, since I first got this case, I've learned one thing about GMs. Some of the GMs in the teens, when you clear the when you clear the memory, they actually erase the um, in use performance tracking. They start from scratch each time. That was not the way it was supposed to be. This is a 2019, and all 2019 and newer are supposed to keep the in use performance tracking information in memory in non volatile memory, so that. If you clear the battery, you don't lose this information. This is a 19. Was it 19 or an 18? Let me, I forgot now. It was 18. So this could be at the cusp of that where the memory was clear. What other thing could clear the memory like this? Keep a live memory or something going? Yeah, and if it's out. erasing when you lose that, that could happen. How about if somebody reprogrammed the vehicle? How about if there was a programming issue? These numbers are way out of whack for what we want. So let's follow the process. Right now, this is a red flag to me. I'm getting these pictures from me from 40 miles away, and I'm telling him, hey, we got a red flag here. The ignition cycles, 65 and for 13,500 miles doesn't add up. And you the carb trips, and again, if you've forgotten these, I'm going to review these later. This is something carb established, but the OEM criteria to, to run the monitor test to flip the flag to determine that the system's failing is zero, that's a red flag to me. So we got some red flags right here. So doing our due diligence from what we learned today, on my website, this is that GM link, and I love this link. If you don't, if you haven't been using this, this will be in your presentation, also on my website. If you do any GMs or Fords, the same site has this on my website. Uh, you can go in here and you can get all, let me see if I can pull this one up. Uh, yeah. You can go and get all the engine family information up to 23 on this one. You can get all the mode six information in here. It's all free. That link takes you there. So example being, if I go into a 2020 and I want some information, I'll just pick an engine family here right now. I don't know what I'm picking. We've gone through this before, but I'm going to keep reminding you every two years, I think this is vital information we don't want to forget. So I can go in here. And believe it or not, every manufacturer has to turn this into carb. I'm going to, looks like I got into some body stuff. Let's see if there's more than what I picked here. Um, I picked under the diagnostics. I would like to pick another one, but I let's see if there's more. There's chassis. Okay, let's see if they got P stuff in here. If not, I'll pick another group. But more importantly, let me pick another group. Uh, let's go into five here and see if they start out with some engine stuff this is the 20s so they may oh there we go um 
So now we're into some numbers that we're used to working with. Let me shrink that down. It's a great link if you're doing GMs, and Ford's link is the same. But they don't. Ford doesn't show you this. So let me pull this down a little bit and get to a point where, one, I can get my drag screen on here. Let me move this. So I can drag my screen down. So let's say I got a problem with a PO. Come on, that's a big chart right there. That's a lot of information for one code. Wow, that's all under one code. Um, come on. Wow. This is one. Uh, oh, that's getting deep. That's why I went too far. Yeah, I'm trying to find one we can all relate to very easily. Okay, there's a 208. I'm trying to get down to something like a, a cat code or O2 code. Codes I O2 I pass. But what they give you basically is how the monitor strategy works, the malfunction criteria, the thresholds, other parameters could interfere, and the enable conditions. Now, I will say this. Sometimes these can be a little deceiving depending on what they give you, but you can decipher enough out if you're having a problem running the car. And we're going to apply this to the car in a minute. Also, this is showing you that they're taking samples. So it doesn't fail on uh, just one test. It has to fail so many times within a key cycle. It says one trip, type A, it's got to fail so many times. So I'll show you examples of it. But this information, if, you got, if you're on GMs, this is the information you need to go. If you're on Fords, you need to go to the Ford free information. Unfortunately, it looks like about 2020, Ford stopped updating this information. Since 1996, you could count on Ford every year to give you gasoline, diesel uh, information and hybrid information of all the OBD2 stuff and emissions. Now it looks like they're stopping at 21. They haven't been updating it. Maybe they're going to do it. Maybe they're not. But if you're on GMs and you need any transmission stuff, you need any mode six stuff, here it is. And we're going to apply this on this vehicle we're doing. So let me close this out. Again, if you don't know where these links are, they're in your PDF or go to my website if you're working on a GM or Ford. And I always say this, if you're working on a diesel uh, and you don't do it a lot, go to the Ford side because a lot of what they have in there applies to the GM, even though the GM doesn't cover it the way Ford does. So you can make sense out of what Ford has shown you to carry over to your GMs, especially for all of us that aren't diesel people. If you got to make the crossover, that's a good way to do it. Okay, so this is we're going to use this. So we go in here, and I should have reversed this. I'm going to do this and back up. For you guys that have been through this before, you probably don't remember, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. Does anyone know when it comes to the O2 sensor what 02 is? 02. See, we're not using the resources we have. This is always. Bank one, sensor two. Where's sensor two? In the rear. So it's telling me right now, when I'm querying this thing, that bank two, and this is the thing I always want to look at if I'm not running the O2 test, I want to find the ones that say either slow, uh, rich to lean response, or lean to rich response. These are usually the blockers that prevent the flag from flip flipping. So we ran the cat already because we ran the other test. These were the zeros we found in mode six, other than the other tests that it reported. So I know right now that this vehicle is going to need a D cell. And he's trying this, and it's not working. If you know these numbers, this is this is bank one, sensor one. There's one test hanging it up here. And if you don't remember the numbers in the last class, I gave you charts. And on my website, I have the charts because some of the scan tools do this. They don't name them. And I know this is always bank two, sensor one. And I know this is always bank two, sensor two. Well, look at this. That side has the same thing. I've got a blocker here. There's something blocking this one. And whenever I see this word delayed, that means I've got a D cell. When I see this slow to rich response, it generally, in most cases, it's a D cell. But on some of the older cars, it could be, in this case, when you see this, it means that you had to decel, and then you had to throttle it up to get that rear O2 up over 700 to 800 millivolts to wake the system up to begin testing. So delay means decel fuel cut. Slow response could be decel fuel cut, or it could be that you had to decel 
like Chrysler's do, Dodge products do, and you have to throttle it up to get that O2 to go rich to be able to now run the test. So right now, these zeros are telling us on this car that it looks like it's a driving issue. But he's been doing this. And I've told him based on these numbers, you need to drive the vehicle this way. And he says, man, I still can't get it. I said, okay, well, let's go the next step. Let's go check our Cal ID and our CVN. And on GM, thank God we could do it so easily. Because if you go, and any of you have AC Delco accounts? Yes. Okay. If you don't and you need this information, you go create yourself a free AC Delco account. And when you get in there, they've moved this information, which was free for years to the outside. Uh, they've moved it under the AC Delco site and also on their own site, but they put it under free resources. So you can get into AC Delco for free and you can get into free resources. In there, you can find the calibration and the CVNs. And you just punch in the VIN or you can just punch in these numbers and they will tell you if they match or they'll pop them up and you can match them the car. So let's walk through this. First of all, if you reprogram and you never really looked at this, some vehicles you can do in a matter of it might take longer because they go and reflash the whole computer. GM here has an example where they have multiple operating systems like on my computer right now. I've got multiple programs on my computer. Replacing one may not affect another. I want you to remember this as we go through this. So here's the main operating system. Then we got engine, fuel, speedometer, engine diagnostics, engine operation. Even if you don't reprogram, you need to be aware of this. Slave operating system. Don't know what that is exactly, but it's another system. And then it says system. Okay, it doesn't tell me exactly what. These are the part numbers for each of these systems. So we went to the GM site, and he was doing this remotely with me. And he goes in the GM, and he punches in this part number, and up pops this number for the CVN, calibration verification number. Well, guess what? It was correct. Because I'm looking for something that's mismatched here, because it looks like the software in my brain may have been tampered with. Maybe someone's written this a couple of times, and something got scrambled. We'll get into that. Then I go into engine. I punch in this number. That's right. I punch in this number. That's right. And I go on down the list. Everything matches up. So I'm getting a little red flag here that Maybe somebody put a parallel tuner in it or somebody's rewritten this computer and something's gotten scrambled. Uh, don't know exactly what it is yet. So after you do this on that site, now you can go ahead and you can search that part number right here. Um, I don't have, I didn't capture the original one, but uh, the original one was 127. Let me zoom that in a little bit was 1271163. It says new software diagnostic enhancement for DTC PO603. That's probably a memory issue with the PCM. And it replaces, it replaces, I excuse me, I have the original in there. It replaces 12688025 with this CVN. So let's go back one screen. We'll look at what's in there. This is the one that's in there. And it says there's a diagnostic enhancement for this. I, it may or not be the problem. It may be the fix. We don't know. But we're going to go ahead and look at this. So he went ahead and he reprogrammed it. So now he's got 12711163 with the matching CVN. All the others stayed the same. Nothing changed. This is the only one that got overwritten. So we go through here and it's got a new program in it. Notice what happened. In this main operating system, I'm going to backtrack, sorry, jumping around, we replaced just the main operating system. And in this case, when we did it, what we have here is all the in-use performance tracking got cleared out because that was stored within that system. You may have cases where you reflash the PCM and this information doesn't go away because it's stored in another part of the PCM. So if you don't overwrite that program, that information stays there. So now I'm starting to think that uh, in this case, one, either the software was the issue, wasn't reporting correctly, or somebody could have overwritten this software. And I'm thinking out of state, supercharger, manual trans, maybe somebody's overwritten the software a couple of times, put in a tuner, try to restore it back to original, who knows. But now I've got a good basis. I've got the right Cal ID, the right CVN, the right software, 
my in-use performance tracking has reset. You can see he started the engine up five times right here, but he hasn't run it for 10 minutes straight. He hasn't idled it for 30 seconds within that 10 minutes. And we'll go over this again in the next unit. And he hasn't driven above 25 miles an hour. Okay, so that's cool. So now he goes out and drives it the way he had been doing it. And because it was a manual trans with such a powerful engine, he had to get the higher speeds than he expected. But he went out and drove it. And look at what's happened to the O2s that weren't running before. These were zeros before, guys. These two were set at zeros. So somewhere in there, we have success on this bank. Bank two, sensor two, I'm bank one, sensor two, we have success. We have achieved our slow to rich response, our rich to lean response. So far, so good. So look at the other ones. There's that delayed one we had earlier for the front one. Well, look at what happened. Zero five is bank one, bank two, sensor one. It is now run. Slow response for the secondary O2, bank two, sensor two, is now populated. Look at what's happened. Okay? So sometimes when you're, when you're facing monitor test, continued driving isn't the answer. So checking software is important. And some of you guys, and I think um, Scott brought it up. You guys remember the last class? I remember covering my Honda that I had the cat stolen on. And uh, after I had the new cat on there, it kept intermittently with a new MagnaFlow on there, kept intermittently flagging PO 420s. And I'm thinking, oh, what's wrong with this MagnaFlow? And I'm doing some searches and I see on a smog check forum, oh, yeah, all those MagnaFlows are crap. And uh, uh, everyone we get in here, seems to be failing after a, after a short period of time. I'm thinking, okay, but that just doesn't add up. So I do a bulletin search and find out that there's an update calibration for the engine computer. And But it doesn't make sense to me because it was dated back in 2012. It's 2021, 2022. I've been driving that car for 10 years. Never had a problem. Never had a drivability issue. Never had a check engine light. How could that be? So just to refresh your memory for you guys around then, I contacted uh, Garrett up at Bar. Said, "Hey Garrett, I got this issue. Uh, I I've been trying this. I even tried a Walker Cat, and uh, it just it's just intermittent. It's not working." I said, "Can you check the database and tell me if this new calibration is in the vehicles that are passing?" And he calls. He gets back to me and sends me a printout. And he said, "Hey Rick, uh, all the Hondas with the Zulevs that are passing in 07." have that latest calibration in it. You know, they had an aftermarket cat because they had a label. Have that aftermarket software. And I'm thinking, okay, not quite sure what's going on, but I'm going to, and I reprogrammed it here at home. I reprogrammed it, took about 25 minutes, drove the car, and it's been passing ever since. And I put in not only the, the MagnaFlow I bought, because I bought this all on insurance money. Then I put in the Walker, which was only, it was a thousand dollars cheaper. And it was passing too. It was actually quieter in the MagnaFlow, uh, but I still had the MagnaFlow in there. It matches my label. It's still passing this day. It's doing well. But my point here being is sometimes you got to look into the software, even if you're not normally a reprogrammer. Don't forget TSBs. Uh, but that TSB still didn't add up in my mind. And the only thing I can figure is that TSB was for the original cat, which had a lot more oxygen uh, storage capacity, where the aftermarket five years. 50,000 miles is not going to be as loaded. And I can even see it in my fuel, some of my fuel trim numbers that I'm definitely getting more oxygen out of the system than I had before. But my point here being with this whole case study, guys, is sometimes when we get into that mode nine, and I say it's a gold mine for bar because they can find tampered vehicles this way. This is what I've been promoting the last two classes. And I'm going to promote again on OBD on UDS is that this information is the stuff that parts don't replace necessarily. And you got to get into this and start understanding it and use that global side because a lot of the OEs don't have some of this stuff uh, to look at this information. Yeah, I've been, he, and to be honest with you, he had already thrown in o, O2s at this car. So start adding up the bill. So before we go to parts, remember, oh, and here's what happened when he got done. He's He's been starting this thing up a lot, no big deal. Now notice, we haven't even driven this vehicle 
and he had 22 ignition cycles. That vehicle earlier for 65,575, uh, um, excuse me, 13,575 had only 65 ignition starts. That vehicle is either being cross-country trips a lot or something was wrong. And I'm going to go back over that in a minute. But notice what happened now. Cats run. Numbers are making sense. When we review this on uh, UDS, this just means carb charge, charge them with six trips because the vehicle had been driven for 10 minutes, 25, uh, five minutes above 25 miles an hour with one 30-second idle period. So CARB says if you drive that way, 30% of the time, that OEM completion should increment. They're happy with that. Well, he's driven the six times on this vehicle, and he got it once, and that's cool. We're not worried about ratios here, but it's shown us what we should have seen earlier. Now, what do we? I mean, before I go on to this last one, I'm going to backtrack because that's something we've learned since then. I always like to do this because even if you saw this before, something I've learned, and I've learned this in the last six months, when you're dealing with GM, and initially I was all over this, this, but this was a clue that made me think about software. When you're dealing with GM in the teens, up to about 18, from about 10 to 18, and more like 12 to 18, because that's when they changed some of their monitor tests, this is not uncommon to see if the memory has been cleared. So if that memory has been cleared, and a good, how do you, anyone know, see, the magic question, Anybody know a quick way to know if the memory's been cleared recently? Look at your uh, flags or monitors. Okay, that could be a clue, but uh, it's a good response. So I did. Uh, Ken, I did. So look at this. Complete, complete, complete. So would that give me any indication that it had been recently cleared? No. How about in global OBD2 on the PID list where it says... Mile since DTC cleared. Miles since DT cleats or warm up cycles. There you go. Are we not using that for our permanent DTCs? Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't have them do this on this one because I wasn't even thinking that way at that time. But I'm trying to show you, I'm not trying to impress you. What I'm trying to show you is if we learn something, I want you to learn from it too. Because I have presented this before and I said, oh, this right away was a reflash. Somebody's reflashed it. No, not necessarily. But two reasons I thought it because. It was in the main operating system. They were reset to zero. I'm thinking this is an out-of-state tuned vehicle. But then I then I learned. I did not know that GM was clearing their in-use performance tracking. And just knowing that for in-use perform performance tracking is helpful because when you see this, you say, oh, somebody must have cleared it. You go over to the global side and say it's got only 15 warm-up cycles or five warm-up cycles. Wow, somebody did clear this. So this is how you put everything together. Okay. So I thought this was a great case study. He was, oh, I'm doing everything right. I'm driving it. And I can't, of course, it's a word was I can't get the monitor. No, you're running monitor tests. The ones I didn't show you on the list were all complete, except these. And remember, when you're having a problem, if you see this terminology right here, slow, rich, lean, slow, uh, lean, rich, or you see delay, that is a DTC that's blocking the O2 from continuing to finish the, and set the flag. CAT will be done, but you got to get these tests to run. And as I said earlier, this means a good D cell, and it might take multiple D cells. This uh, here could be that you need a good D cell, or you might have to artificially enrich it by giving it a good D cell and then throttle it up. As Chrysler will tell you, Dodge will tell you, you got to throttle it back up quickly to 70 miles an hour to drive that rear O2 over 700 millivolts to wake it up to say, okay, we're going to now run the test. Then it takes three D cells to get that to happen. So focus on these words, delayed or slow response. And that's why the O2 doesn't flip complete, even though the cat is done. Okay. Any Anything on this one? Again, I'm not trying to impress you on this. I'm just trying to show you that if you follow this, when you have this information, when you're running that one car, oh, you say, oh, I see 100 cars and I might only see this once. How many times did that one time one time take you? How much time did it take you? And how much money did it take you to get that one time to do what it did? This guy runs these things all the time. He does a great job of it. But he's got one here that's kicking his butt. And it's, oh, I drove it. I did what I was supposed to do. Well, let's look at the numbers. Numbers are telling you, well, I did that. Okay, well, then let's go to the next level. 
These numbers were red flagged first for me, even though now I know GM clears them. So now I'm not, I'm taking a different approach on this, but I am going to check software because I'm thinking out of state, manual trans, supercharged engine, be like uh, Ken looking at a diesel and hearing come in the door. So I'm going to verify this. And GM, in GM's case, they make it easy for you to do this. Every manufacturer has to release that chart I showed you earlier about all the all the DTCs and the criteria. That all goes to the state of California and EPA. GM is the only one that releases this information on a website where you can go match up these numbers and quickly identify if somebody's tampered with it or not. Hey, if only everybody had done that. But in this case, I don't know. Maybe that we don't know enough about this information. Uh, there was, no, you know, some of you work with manufacturers. The only time you ever replace is there's a TSB. GM has been known for years that they'll do enhancements and they'll never actually tell you why. Oh, yeah, diagnostic enhancement. Well, what is that? Well, diagnostic enhancement in this case could be running the O2 test, for all I know. I don't know. It, but I also suspect that maybe somebody had overwritten this computer and re tried to replace it and something got scrambled. And then there just happened to be another software in this. I had a buddy in, uh, who was dealing with this with an F-150, and he just finally got it, and he had to do a replace and reprogram, and he rewrote the software. It wasn't an update. It was rewrite software. Something got scrambled. Somebody had messed with that. Whatever happened, that fixed it. And then let your in-use performance tracking back you up, query the O2s to see where the zeros are, and then watch to see that they populate. Then you have success. Again, it's not every day. It's that one car, two cars every now and then that have the situation that we're hard-headed. And what do we do? We keep driving it and driving it and driving it or telling the customer to go drive it, drive it, drive it. Use my chart back in the beginning. Sorry to jump around on you again. Use this chart to give you a guideline. Even if you only stop right here and you don't get down into this, you know the light's not on. Check for Always check for petting codes. Uh, but even if you don't go down here, this is a good starting point between what's complete and what's the history of it. And we'll go over that a little bit more again when we get into UDS, because this will be big time in UDS. It's not even trying to scare you. It's stuff that you should already know from previous class. You maybe not be using, but you should start looking at because this is going to come out in a document that's going to show it to you. Okay. Um, any questions on that? Not trying to impress you, just trying to say to you, just follow a plan. When you have that one vehicle that's kicking your butt, think about these things. Guys, this is not published in any books. No one out there is covering this. Manufacturers aren't covering it. Matter of fact, manufacturers are dumber on this than anybody I've run into in the industry. The better you understand this, and we'll go back over it again, the quicker you will be in identifying monitor tests with problems. And that's why one of the reasons CARB is going to the new UDS system because the information is going to be longer in bits. They're going to attach more information, but they're going to give more of this stuff, not for the group of O2s, but for each O2 test. And now you can look and see, wow, look at the ratio on this one test. That's what's kicking my butt. Now I just get the O2 test results like here, but I don't know what test it was that was kicking my butt. I have to go back over here and decipher it, hopefully from the O2 data, to pick out which test might be it. So this is the way we want to use this. Okay, the last one, um, my buddy who does stay in Illinois, this is their, this is Bob's garage back there. He does repairs only. He gets the vehicles after they fail the smog. This vehicle will not set a, um, a readiness flag um, for O2 heater, O2, and cat. So he goes through all this information. You can see their printout back there, how they do it. It's out-of-state vehicles come from Texas. So he follows the chart. And one of the key ones right here is, please, don't forget this. Don't forget TSBs is one of your checks. And here's the Ford when he comes in the door at zero, 00 on the on the cat. One cat is zero, 00. The other cat is zero, but out of 6,386 times, which makes no sense. This is the kind of thing that catches your attention that says, hey, has somebody been in there tampering? And a lot of times, where do they mess? They mess with cats and they mess with O2s. Don't know exactly what happened here, but this is how you use it. So he does the old, I've got him now better than this. So he sends me this information. There's populated. And we're going to go over this part right here when we get into UDS. As a reminder, 
We're going to go over this no, yes, no, what that means now could be beneficial to you. But it is telling us the O2 test should be able to run, should be able to run. And in this case, there were numbers in there from before, but it hasn't run this key cycle. So this has run in the past, but it hasn't run this key cycle. And uh, but it's got some numbers in there. Now, he didn't send me that one. He didn't send me the bank one sensor one, but he sent me bank two sensor two. And look at what we got down here. We got zero, zero. So that's a red flag right there. We got bank two sensor two. We got zero, zero. So we got a blocker there. We don't know why. And if you take a look, it's hoping someone would say, well, how could these be populated and it hasn't run this trip? Because complete at this trip means did the rear O2s also run? And if you take a look, the rear O2s haven't run. There's zero zeros. There's your blocker. So you have to focus on what it takes to run these rear O2s. So now he reprograms it. And notice how everything went back to zero. He found a TSB. TSB said to reprogram the vehicle. There's an update. And now notice what happens. Complete, 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 complete. Complete, complete, and there's our O2, there's our O2 heater, and there's our cat. So again, there are software issues that fixes do. There are software that gets scrambled if somebody's been messing with it. Um, you never know. Now look at what he was able to do within a couple trips out. And this is the one I want to show you. This is on a Ford, and it does say complete, but it hasn't updated yet because in the averaging, there's like multiple cells. And they did a fast pass on this. In other words, the first time after they cleared the memory, it ran and it passed. But Ford wants to put numbers in these multiple cells to be able to establish long range and average. So they passed them for a, what we call, I call a fast pass. You guys know what a fast pass is on a dyno. You're driving along and all of a sudden you're boom, you're going from 50 15 to 25 25. This one here passed the first trip flip the flag, but it still says zero because it's just been cleared and it wants to fill in these memory cells so it can begin after a while to average them out. So it says, hey, high score, low score, get rid of those, filter out the middle. That's why you'll see this change. I didn't know this till this case study. And I ran it by this Bob Grzynski who wrote this stuff and he says, this is how it happens. And Mike McCarthy up a card explained this to me. So I want, if you run into these numbers, and I have the notes. Your handouts will have the notes on these so you can refer back to. So here's a case where it was zero, but it was only because of the fact it had to, had to do an averaging mode. Okay. And then when he got done, there's proof in the pudding. This one was run before. This was run before. But look what happened to the rear ones. So using this stuff, if your tool doesn't, if you're on OE side and your tool's not showing this, if you're ever looking for some uh, decent aftermarket scan tools that could help you get this information fast, let me know. Uh, I've been doing some work for Innova, and I'm very impressed with some of their little series. Their 35s, their 43s, and uh, their 50s at a reasonable amount of cost. Uh, and for a tech that doesn't need them all the time, it does OE, it does global. I'm not selling you anything. That's not what I'm here for. To say to you, if you don't have one, you don't have to go out and buy a Snap-on. You can buy some other tools that will do a good job of giving this information and getting the same result. So there's stuff out there at a much lower price. I'm not putting out snap on or anything. Don't get me wrong. But for you guys that may be an OE and you don't want to have uh, a big expensive aftermarket tool, there's some nice lower end tools that you can get in for a, lo a low amount of money and do a good job. Okay. So this is what I want to try and condition you to do. And I want to build this into the UDS. So again, just highlighting the things that populate it, and that the monitor is now done. So, okay, and then the last one, I think we covered this, but I'm going to hit it anyway. I, everybody see, Most everybody sees Hondas, except for maybe up north where Ken is. Um, they probably put Hondas in the back of the trucks up there, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one of the things we're seeing, and I always want to update you on what we learned, and I may have covered the last class, but I'm not positive, but I'm going to hit it again. Late model Hondas with IV techs without EGR, and some even with EGR, they have IV tech. Notice we got 501 conditions. That means we met the bottom numbers are the CARB trips, what CARB says we're charging you with. Notice the CAT, 213 out of 501. Okay, I'm not worried about that. Depends. I don't know the driving. 
The O2s are going with high percentage. That's all I care right now. The uh, O2 again is going with high percentage, high percentage. Uh, secondary, area, there is none, but look at the EGR. This guy down in Monterey has got to get this vehicle in his dealership to pass so they can sell it. It's come in from, oh, it's got no, excuse me. This is an out of state military vehicle being smogged to be able to be registered in California. And look at right there. Look at all the other ones. We're 501, 501, 501. This is telling you EGR is never completed. But we came from out of state, so no one really cared. No, no one really knew. Anybody run into Hondas that have that have trouble running the EGR slash VVT? Okay. If you don't, you probably will, because they've been doing this since about 2016. This is the dual stage VVT. The first one runs easily in about the 4,000 range. The second one has to be run at 6,300 RPM or higher. So you can see where the dilemma is there. All this is saying is we never met the enable criteria for the OEM. This customer is not bearing it over 6,300 RPM. Simple as that. That's why it's not happening. So if you get any of those late model Hondas that have IV tech, you either got to drop them in a low gear and throttle them up for about three to five seconds to get that second stage to kick in, or you got to get up on some high speed and really crank this thing out to get that top number to increment. Okay, so something to think about. There, it's not. It's not a problem. It's not a. It's something that Carb allowed. They made an exemption for it and said we're not going to charge you with a trip unless you hit both conditions. Okay. Well, they may have hit both conditions, but they may not hit it long enough to complete the monitor test. So that's why this is one and this is zero. Think about people, a lot of people driving around with these engines. They're driving around for gas mileage. They're not driving around for performance. So you get one of those in the door and you see something like this. This is a simple matter of getting the RPM up in drive over 6,300 RPM after cruising and let this thing count itself down. So that's a common problem that are out there. Okay, anything else? We haven't covered anything we've covered you want to discuss? Rick, is there a handout? That yeah, I'm there is. I'm sending you, I'm going to send you today the updated handout because I updated some things on this thing. So you're going to get a PDF file in a format that has the actual text with it, as many notes as I could put in there, Ken. Yeah. So you'll have three of those this weekend. And you'll have the, if you want to reference back at a later date, you'll have a uh, capture uh, video of the class too. So I'll work on that this afternoon and get those out to you. So later today, you'll get the handout and you'll get a link to the video because as soon as this is over, because we're about done, as soon as this is over, um, the, ven the video will render to the cloud and then I'll turn it into a video that I can put out there and give you a link to. And uh, you can use that as future reference. What I like about the PDF files is put them on a thumb drive when you get them, take them, take them work, put them on your computer there and keep them as a reference. Um, it's much easier and cheaper than paper. And, uh, but they will all definitely have, not every slide has notes. Some of them don't need them, but most will have notes too, to help you, uh, reference that. Okay. Anything else, guys, let me stop this year. So I told you this class is about information. It's not about time. We're about eh, 20 minutes earlier than I thought for today, but that's okay. Not a concern. Tomorrow we'll finish up with UDS. OBD on UDS, which will be new to almost will be new to everybody. But then again, when I do it, I'm going to show you what you already know that makes that easier to teach you that system. Uh, do I have any 